Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Contemplative Science Podcast. It's my pleasure, as always, to be here with Dr. Mark Miller. Mark, how are you, mate? Hey, man, how's it going? Very good, especially good. I feel like I say that a lot, but um, it seems week by week, I always feel a little bit especially good, but this week I'm especially, especially good. Um, you know, we've been talking um, about getting more people on the show doing love and kindness and thinking about compassion, and that's really a big research interest of mine right now. And uh, that's exactly what we get to talk about in today's pod. So I'm, I'm stoked. Yeah, so today we're lucky enough to have Dr. Paul Condon. Um, Paul is an associate professor of psychology at Southern Oregon University. He has served as a visiting lecturer for the Center of Buddhist Studies at Rangjin Yeshe Institute and is the co-creator of the Sustainable Compassionate Training alongside Lama John Makransky. Paul, how are you? Hey guys, I'm great. It's great to be here with both of you. Thanks for having me. It's so rare we get to have a chance, even on a channel like this, and just talk about the mechanics of compassion. I know. And you know, when we started the show, one of the reasons why compassion came to mind as an interesting topic is because it's right on the interface of something we use all the time in language. We recognize on one level to be important, but feels relatively unexplored, at least for me before starting uh, the research for this episode. So it's a term we use a lot, and especially in our circles. And I just want to establish what is a useful working definition of compassion? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for raising that, Jamie. I think um, we talk a lot about compassion, but what does it actually mean and how does it actually show up in our daily lives and, and um, how do we experience it and all that I think is a really important question. Um, typically in, in science, in the fields that I'm professionally trained in, people define compassion as a sensitivity to others' suffering, as well as motivation to alleviate or respond to that suffering in some way. So there's that sort of multi-dimensional aspect, the sensitivity to or awareness of another's suffering, and then a motivation to respond to it. So that's now, why it's not uh, just sympathy or empathy. Right. Sympathy yeah. and empathy could be rather passive in a way, but um, compassion is sort of um, uh, set up as an action. Yeah, that's right. It's not just mirroring another's emotions or merely gaining access to the content of another person's emotions or state, but um, also that motivational or action based response to respond to it. Yeah, yeah it might surprise people listening that compassion is something that can be trained or even discussed in quite the level of scientific detail we're going to today and you've been doing for a number of years. What are the quantitative measures you use when tracking something like compassion? Yeah, there's all kinds of measures out there and they have different strengths or weaknesses. A lot of people have used self-report, like how do people feel in response to encountering another suffering? What are their emotional states? Um, which can help us understand what people are experiencing. It could also include um, various kinds of physiological measures of like, how does our body react when we're experiencing or exposed to another person suffering? How does our attention change in terms of the way that our eyes are moving as a matter of attention? What do we look at? Um, in my work as a social psychologist, it's been uh, important to try to measure actual behavior so when people encounter another person's suffering or difficult situation, how do they actually behave in response to that? What actions do they take as a tr attempt to respond to that suffering? And those kinds of behavioral measures, like in a real world social interaction, might tell us something that goes beyond what uh, people say they would do or think they would do. It, it sort of gives us a, an assessment of what actually happens in the moment so I think those measures are, are really helpful, but I think it's like um, that metaphor of uh, the blind man and the elephant. Are you guys familiar with that yes. metaphor? Yeah. Like um, each person touches the elephant and sees or reports something slightly different and not the whole picture. I think all these measures are like that. Like each measure is giving us a slightly different understanding of compassion, but no one measure alone is going to give us the full picture. Yeah, right. And that's actually a useful lead into this next topic, because people can feel compassionate in certain contexts, but not others. And, you know, you might be very compassionate when it comes to human suffering, but have a 
blind spot with animal suffering. Or I know a number of people with sort of the opposite set of uh, traits. And it's just interesting that you can be compassionate in, to use a silly example in one place but not another. And I was wondering sort of what expl why that is true and why that, and whether that implies that compassion is more complicated or rather humans are more complicated than just having a set level of compassion. Yeah, it's a, that's a, a big question and also, uh, I think, a complicated one for us to try to answer scientifically. Um, we might be compassionate for particular reasons in certain cases. Like, there may be factors that, you know, so to speak, pull on our heartstrings a little bit, like more than others. So when we come into interaction with people who we perceive as more similar to us, there's a kind of automatic or, or natural compassion that flows very easily from that. When we are in contact with people who we experience as dissimilar from us in some way, we might be less likely to um, immediately experience compassion or for whatever reason, we might shut down our compassionate response because we maybe perceive that person as less trustworthy or less likely to reciprocate on our our pro-social actions. Um, so there's, there's these different factors that might shape the way that the mind evaluates or praises the situation at hand that shapes a compassionate response. Another one that researchers have measured and studied is uh, what's called like a perceived responsibility for difficulty or suffering. So if our mind paints a narrative or picture of another person as not deserving their suffering, then compassion might flow more easily or more automatically. Yeah. If the mind paints a narrative of perceiving another person as deserving or responsible for their own suffering, then we might be less likely to, the mind might be less likely to respond or might come up with reasons to shut down our compassionate response. It's a good reason why the move from the, um, from the moral um, uh, approach to thinking about addiction, why it was a good move to go to something like a disease model. Because <clears throat> what you're doing yeah. is you're, you're, you're taking a step and saying, look, it's not completely this person's fault. Um, it has to do with exactly. all these other constituent features. Exactly. And that actually opens people up to want to be uh, more helpful, more supportive, more compassionate. We have um, some research coming out of our lab right now where we're looking at um, where the people who are doing it are looking at um, perceived effectiveness or controllability and compassion, which I think is pretty interesting. That if you don't feel like you have the power to make a change, you also don't perceive situations as ones where, um, where compassion can be. So like if you have learned helplessness, for instance, um, then you become in some way less compassionate because the system isn't expecting that it can make a positive impact. And so you don't really notice those situations where you could make a positive impact. Pretty interesting. Yeah, that's great. It, it raises another thought um, about perceived efficacy is another right. thing that researchers right. have started to spend time studying. Um, if we perceive that we have some efficacy to yeah. engage in compassion and exactly. to help another, it actually motivates our efforts to actually upregulate our compassion and then interact and, and reach out and try to help others if we think and perceive that we're actually going to have some benefit for others. I don't know, but doesn't that make it feel like the way that we're approaching the climate crisis could be updated a little bit? Because if you're, if the primary message is there's nothing we can do or the problem is really so substantial, then you might be also undercutting people's drive or motivation or intention to try to get involved. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you show little rewards, you show little places where people can make a real impact and then you feed back to them, look, here's the positive impact happening in real time, that might actually amplify our tendency to be compassionate and to go out and try to help. Interesting. Yeah, that's great. It's kind of like a, a growth mindset. Like if we, right. if we perceive that we have some control or ability and, and there's little rewards that uh, show us or signal us our progress towards that, then we'll put in more effort. I think right. that's a nice uh, parallel. Yeah, Steven Pinker wrote a book uh, which was perceived as quite controversial called Enlightenment Now, where he explained how things were getting better. So he would use different measures of that, you know, mortality, violence, dictatorships, existential threats. And the reason he said he wrote the book, his motivation for writing the book was, if you ask the average American, is violence going up or down? They'll all say up. And you keep on asking, but it's not true, is the point he's trying to make. And why is that significant? Because as you say, the, there's an efficacy thing going on here. 
And when you perceive things are getting better, well, now I can make a connection between action and meaningful outcome. Whereas it's just an interesting link between compassion and action I hadn't previously considered. Yeah, there's another um, follow up to all this that I think relates to engaging in meditation practice or compassion mm -hmm. training where like with pro-social actions or compassionate actions, we may have some doubts are about our ability to connect with others or doubts are about ability to effectively engage in compassion. Like there's a lot of pressure around that of being a compassionate person. It's kind of loaded. Um, but if we can, if we can learn to uh, kind of notice that impulse and, and let go of it a little bit, like our compassion can just kind of flow more freely like we're learning not to try so hard to be the compassionate person to mm. try to achieve something that's so-called compassionate and actually let go of that goal. It sort of might free up more capacity to then actually connect with others. So I think that's where like efficacy and uh, compassion training have an important contribution. And you, um, you teach a very, um, uh, perhaps not unique because I know it's grounded in tradition, but you teach um, a really mm -hmm. specific form of training for how you can grow compassion and in particular um, what you call sustainable compassion. It'd be great to talk about that a little. Sure, yeah. Um, so this is a particular model of compassion training that, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, John McCransky, who's a, a teacher in the Tibetan Nyingma tradition, has developed as an adaptation of a kind of pattern of practice in Tibetan Buddhism um, and also in, in collaboration with several other people who've contributed, and, and I've one of those people who've contributed to the evolution of this particular model of compassion training. The, the, I think the distinctive piece about this is that it assumes a starting point of relationality. And that's quite radically different, I think, from a kind of um, Western, modern, cultural understanding of education where we think of any kind of skill or thing we're trying to gain expertise in, it's going to happen from a lot of our own individualized effort and discipline. And even, and we approach meditation with this same kind of mindset. And I, this is how it was for me. Like when I first got into meditation, I thought that a mark of my success was how consistently I was able to get to the cushion every day and like I'd track it on my phone using an app and I got really excited when the numbers kept getting higher and higher and higher and that's yeah. like that's good meditation practice like I'm yeah. really I'm really engaging in it um, and there's some benefit to that but it's a kind of it's a, a limited individualistic kind of like a willpower kind of model for meditation practice through our own individualized effort we'll work hard and get better at being compassionate and wise. So this, the SCT sustainable compassion training model challenges that mentality and suggests that actually the starting point for all of this, for development of compassion and, and insight and wisdom is relational and that it begins by um, kind of like entering into a sense of community and support or lineage for practice. That's a traditional way of describing it, that we've been supported by others who've come before us in, in these practices, and that helps us to cultivate or, or access our own innate capacities for compassion. Um, so the way that would look for somebody who maybe not be Buddhist or not familiar with Buddhist traditions that I'm speaking from might be to call to mind a moment of caring connection like somebody any moment from within your own life where you felt a sense of being held in care could be like a moment of being with a grandparent even just a simple moment not like a big complex relationship just a simple moment of playing a game or eating a meal together maybe even somebody saying hi to you and greeting you in a really friendly way a moment where you felt a sense of care, where you were the object of another person's care. Or it could be a benefactor, like somebody in the world 
who's had a positive impact on you in some way, even if you've never met them before, like through their words, their writing or their artwork or music, like calling to mind an inspirational figure or could be a spiritual figure, like a spiritual person who being or person who's feels kind of divine or evokes that sense of inspiration for, for an individual. So within SCT, what we've been trying to do is help people to populate their own field of care, their own kind of external source of care that they could call to mind. And by calling that to mind, they can begin to experience the loving, caring qualities and energy that comes with being in a field of care. Yeah. I and, love that right uh, off the bat, especially, yeah. especially the pragmatic bit. Sorry to cut you off, but the pragmatic bit is so fascinating because you're right. Like any caring ability that you have came from mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's been lots of little caring support systems that have been in your life the whole time. So it's not you on your mat alone trying to build something you've never encountered before. Exactly. Rather, you're tuning, refining, and maturing something that's already got momentum. You've got grandparents, potentially parents, teachers, kind people, and if you're lucky, spiritual teachers, uh, role models. They've all been part of this momentum for you, and you're just, you're just carrying that forward rather than trying to start something uh, immediately from scratch. Exactly, yeah. I, I'm interested in natural variation and compassion. And I don't mean natural as in from birth. I mean, just people who haven't trained it formally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Scientifically speaking, there's three of us here. If you assumed none of us had any compassion training, could you, would you expect us to have similar levels of compassion or is there rad room for radical difference? Yeah, it's an important question, Jamie. Thanks for raising it. So another important part of all this is that we can assume that we all have an innate capacity for compassion. And that comes out of evolutionary psychology and anth cultural anthropology that we are social species and we are highly interconnected and that we flourish when we're in social connection and that we have those capacities for collaboration, empathy, care, and supporting each other. So we all have that. It's not like this field of care practice is giving us something that we're not already endowed with. We have it. And it's, it's more that these relational moments are actually occurring and helping to draw that out more and more. Um, that also comes out of a perspective in psychology called attachment theory that I've spent a lot of time studying that um, infants are uh, sort of motivated to attach to their primary caregiver as a source of survival. And that emotional bond then ensures their development and survival over time. And that then supports their ability to reach out and give care to others. So to answer your question, like each of us has that innate capacity and um, whether or not we've engaged in contemplative practice, it's there. And we've, you know, we each have our individualized histories and experiences and lives, but each of us has had at some point, some moments of positive social connection that we can draw on, even if it's not immediately obvious to us, there's some moments like that, even if it's with like a pet, like with a cat or a dog, like there's some positive social connection and experience that we can unearth and even if we're not explicitly engaged in meditation practice, those positive social connections are part of our life and can help draw out those innate capacities for compassion. So I think this relational model helps and it, it works for explaining variations and capacities for compassion, even if we're not explicitly engaged in meditation practice. So in essence, we've all had experiences of connection like a primary one would be as an infant with mm -hmm. the caregiver and mm -hmm. our capacity, quote unquote, well, and our current levels as opposed to capacity for compassion kind of references those, you know, if you've had strong connections that have formed compassion, you might find it easier a thing to uh, produce. Whereas um, that's different to saying we have a different capacity for compassion, which we're committed to saying 
Well, no, everyone's got the capacity and it's about training. Mm -hmm. um, the question that then emerges is you distinguish between three parts of this training or three yep. parts of compassion. Um, and it's not a distinction I heard before. Can you kind of break that down? You mean the three different modes of, of compassion training? Yeah, so this is, again, something that's come out of uh, work with a number of people, with John and, and others. Um, another person who's contributed to it is Brooke Lavelle. And um, the three modes of practice on uh, receptive mode, deepening mode, inclusive mode, or sometimes it's just called receiving care, deep self-care, or, or extending inclusive care. So the idea is that 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 I, relational starting point, first connecting with a kind of moment or field of care is receiving care, or we also sometimes refer to it as receptive. We're becoming receptive to qualities of care. And it starts as a kind of external source. Like we talked about different figures coming from an external source. In attachment theory, it'd be an external secure base. That's a lot, a lot of um, these relational practices that come from traditional contemplative cultures are like calling to mind the Buddha or in Christian practices, calling to mind the divine grace of God, like an external secure base is the relational, the receptive mode that helps to then access our own inner refuge or inner secure base, which is the qualities of love and compassion themselves, that's actually not dependent on anything external. So there's that relationship between the external secure base and the internal secure base. And then as we increasingly become more familiar with accessing that internal secure base, the inner qualities of love and compassion, it's like a, um, a deepening mode or a, a deep self-care deepening mode of practice where we're learning to increasingly inhabit and identify with those. So it's not that it's like something external is coming in and giving us something. We're actually learning to identify with the source of those loving qualities as if that's actually coming from me. That's who we are. We thought that we were maybe like, some other identity that wasn't lovable or wasn't good enough. Like we have those senses of ourself as we move about our day, but this external pattern, this external refuge is helping us to access something from within. That's actually more deeply who we are from this tradition. And then that becomes the basis for the extending mode, which is then relating to others coming from that internal secure base and sensing others from that, like becoming a, an extension of the field of care, becoming the field of care for others is the, the third mode. So yeah. I've been practicing, I've been practicing actually in this style for the last little while. Um, I've just been reading John's book and uh, I attended John's last course and I'm set up to attend John's next course. I'm definitely going to be sitting with you in the future. And uh, I'm finding it extremely beneficial. It's a, it's a lovely way of maturing and it feels uh, something like an advanced compassion training, which I love. I mean, it's also very accessible, but I find there's lots of hidden resources in it. But one of the things that really comes up for me training like this and seeing the benefits of training like this is how remarkably important it is to have an experience of non-transactional love in your life and how in turn, how important it is to try to be that point for other people so that they have at least one person where they felt it because you know, in the West, we have a lot of self-hatred. It seems like one of the biggest things we're trying to move out of the way is self-hatred and self-doubt. And I like it that there's this sort of sneaky way around. Don't start with self-love. That might be too big, of a, too big of a gulp. Start where you feel like somebody else loves you, if you can have access to that. And then get on board with them loving you so that you start loving you. And somewhere along there, you get into the place where you can start giving love in the same sort mm -hmm. of way. It's a, it's a really, it's like, it feels like a very like specifically sort of Western approach because of the self-hatred as a primary issue. But again, what the, what comes right out of that is how valuable it is, how important it is that we can, to the degree that we can, um, be that non-transactional love point for other people so that they can have a chance to feel it 
so that they can have a chance to practice in this way. Yeah, I love what you're saying, um, Mark, about how you had already been engaged in a, in a deep contemplative practice and then encountering this, it, it was able to fit into that. So it's not like it needs to wipe out or no. take over, or replace, or, or sort of challenge what other people's contemplative practices no. have been, but it can, it like can be a, yeah, yeah, it can, straight. it can fit in really seamlessly yeah. and support yeah. and then inform yeah. or uncover other aspects of your practice yeah. that you've already been doing. I love that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in response to what you just said is that um, upon first kind of encountering this idea, we might feel like, oh, it's hard to identify a particular moment like what you described of like a really non-transactional loving moment like that might be hard to find yeah. um, for some people yeah. and as we continue to try out different options like those three options I described the simple caring moment or a benefactor or, or a spiritual field we just try different ways of doing it and then as, over time what can happen is like the, the threshold for what counts as a caring moment or field of care can lower. We can start to notice it more and more in our life. Like just walking outside and feeling the warmth of the sun is yeah, like a caring moment. To it. You get sensitized to it in a way. Huh? Suddenly yeah. everything is giving it. Yes. That's super interesting because when I think about whether you've received love in an unconditional way, I don't tend to think of receptiveness or sensitivity to that stimuli as something that's trainable. It's a kind of a back, it's sort of a, in, a counterintuitive idea, right? There is love and there is compassion and I'm on the receiving end of those wholesome dynamics, but I might not be noticing it. Yes, um, that's exactly it. Is, why is it that training it allows us to notice it to a greater degree. Yeah. So here again, I think that the attachment theory framework is really helpful. Um, within that theory, there's a concept called internal working model, which is like basically a model or a sense of ourselves in relationship to other people and in relationship to the world. And this starts very early. So through our pattern of, of interactions with a primary caregiver, we start to internalize a sense of ourself that feels basically worthy of care, or we might have an internalized sense of ourself that receiving care from others is contingent. Like we might have this insecure sense of self that like care from others is only contingent on me being a certain way. And so then that's a source of these like uh, the potential self-hatred or, or lack of self-worth that we feel that we're only worthy of care for certain reasons or in certain ways. And we develop a sense of the world then built up around that model of ourselves. But if, as we do these kinds of practices... So as we do these kinds of practices, we might notice some vulnerabilities or challenges that arise. Like I'm doing the field of care practice, it's going great, but then all of a sudden my mind uh, starts to come up with some stories about why this is not trustworthy or why this is not a good idea. Like I shouldn't be paying attention to myself. I should just be out there focusing on others. So sort of the mind engages in its familiar like stories that it tells and it, it disrupts the practice. So that's very common. And it's part of the process. It's part of the process of practice. And we just, we can learn to become increasingly granular around all of this, like increasingly granular around different senses of self or different models of ourselves. And um, then work with that within practice, like let those senses of self be included right within the practice. Cause perhaps what those senses of self need is to experience the loving qualities that come from practice. That's part of the, that's the process of training that we've been working with within SCT. Um, and as we keep doing that, we will start to then, we can start to notice those qualities of love and the field of care more readily. It's like our mind is more sensitive to it or more attuned to it. And, less likely to perhaps uh, tell a distorted story about sources of love from the external world. 
because we maybe we're more open to it or more, um, we yeah, more receptive to it, more trusting of it, as opposed to trusting the familiar stories our mind has been telling. I love, I love that point around trusting it because it's quite a common story in developmental psychology that we interact with acts like that purport to be unconditional love. But if we've had experiences where that threatens to be the case, but then the rug has been pulled, we're going to feel deeply insecure about that kind of thing. Um, and the darker side of this is when you think about the number of times people who are physically abused go on to physically abuse others. It just seems that there's a developmental period here that you keep referring to, um, which is just such, just so much explanatory work when it comes to where we find ourselves at any one time with regards to say compassion. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, another point here is that as we do the practice more and more and identify more and more different kinds of field of care, what the mind is beginning to learn or what it can learn to trust is that the ability to access that internal secure base, those internalized senses of refuge or internalized qualities of love and compassion are actually not dependent on any one relationship or any one field of care. It's like not about the content of the field of care practice that's most important or like the primary point. What's actually primary is that internal source, the internal source of the loving qualities. So it's like if I can engage in the field of care practice and do the field of care like that, that moment of experiencing the sun or the lake or my grandma or, you know, my friend at work, like various different sources, it's like that ability to connect and feel those internal loving qualities is actually not dependent on any one person. And then because of that, we can actually trust that it's deeper. It's beyond all of those particular images or frameworks. So you're really learning that these things are natural. <clears throat> They're natural in us in some way. And the more yes. you can do that, then the less you need to be worried because you have a refuge of these things in yourself. Exactly. I remember a spiritual yeah. teacher one time saying something similar um, about feeling good when you go shopping. And they were like, you get confused all the time that the thing you buy is what makes you feel good. But what makes you feel mm -hmm. good is the chemical the chemical changes in you. They're, they're yours. You own all of those chemicals. They're in you, ready to go. And they said, uh, if you want to test this the next time you go shopping or you know, just imagine it, you know, notice that if you imagine doing that, you get the same feeling even without it. And uh, you can check. And they were like, if you, if you see it and you don't feel that way, then you don't need to buy it. And if you can imagine it and you do feel that way, then you don't need to buy it either because that means you're already having it turned on in you. Uh, a bit of a cheeky teaching, but I like it. You know, yes. you start learning that joy, joy comes from the inside out rather than the outside in. The outside is just the trigger for the thing that's happening inside of you. And that would be a great skill to learn to be able to just open to the sense of being supported in love. Um, I can't think of something that would be more transformative for a culture than to say, oh, now if I want to feel supported, I can just turn my mind to it and I feel supported and I'm going to use that as a steady base to now support others and to work my way through the world. Are you seeing a lot of change in your, I mean, you must, you must see loads of change in your students and in the, in the spaces around you. This is, um, this seems like a really impactful, feels like a way you can really impact people. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's great. Um, you know, in terms of teaching, I teach at the university here and I teach practices like this, um, within my courses and, I think it, it has a huge impact for making people feel a little bit more at ease in, in the classroom, um, a little bit more at ease in being able to connect with others um, and recover memories from their life that they may have forgotten about. I think that's a really fun outcome of doing this field of care practice repeatedly as we can begin to recall moments from our life that we totally forgot about, but actually are quite enjoyable and quite meaningful and yeah. moments when we were experiencing yeah. 
care and yeah, love. Yeah, starting, starting to turn the volume up on the good stuff that's happened because we can be a bit Teflon for the good, you know, a bit of a sponge for the bad, as they say. Um, can I just yeah. check there for a second? You do this in your classes, but I don't think they're meditation classes you're teaching. So what classes are you teaching at university where you're are you getting your students to do field of care practices in the class? That sounds awesome. Yeah, well, I teach classes um, broadly related to health, psychology, okay. so class called stress management, health psychology. Yeah. I also teach a class uh, called sustainable compassion, where we go through the whole sequence of various practices and, and do readings related to, uh, oh. you know, the, the scholarly work around all of this. So we do, there's class. sort of very novels. That's, yes. That's a university class. Well, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What a great class. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. I'm lucky. And obviously, like, as we're hinting at quite strongly, there's a practical edge here. How do we build these muscles? Like today, if I wanted to say, okay, I'm inspired by that conversation. Let's start building mm -hmm. those muscles. How would I go about it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like any other kind of activity. It's a matter of uh, practice and repetition. So, you know, we've been through our lives. We maybe have been inhabiting these stories about ourselves that occlude the field of care. And so it's when we first encounter the practice, it might feel really inspiring and, and motivating and we really like it. And then we forget about it. So it's a matter of repetition of keep coming back to it, like repeat the practice, um, keep looking for uh, different fields of care in our life if we don't immediately come up with something. So keep looking and then continuing to come back and do the practice and, and also connect with others who have engaged in the practice, like others who maybe have more experience with it as a way to support, because there is inevitable challenges that will come up. And so it's helpful to connect with other people who have done those practices as a way to, to get input and support. It's sort of like when we practice together, we're also generating a field of care for each other. Yeah. Like we can really feel that in like a community meditation practice setting or on a retreat where yeah. It's not just that we're all individually in our heads doing something. We're actually supporting each other uh, by doing practice together. I'm actually leading a reading group right now on uh, John's book on this mm -hmm. practice. We have about 30 people in the reading group. And uh, we, cool. we just did this the last session. You know, we're on Zoom and you see 30 people's faces and we're about to do a field of care practice. And you just say, hey, by the way, check it out. Like if you didn't think you had a field of care, look around. You have 30 people right now, literally caring that you do well. Uh, what a nice basis. Do you, do you perceive, do you perceive um, the shifts? I mean, so are the shifts recognizable for, from someone else's point of view? Or is it something most obviously identifiable as the individual doing the practices? Oh, like, do we notice it within ourselves versus like noticing other practitioners? Yeah, if I signed yeah. up my roommates would I tell the difference in six months time <laughs> yeah I, I think so <laughs> roommate right now Jamie is that what this is about <laughs> like how fast will they start doing the dishes when they're supposed to if I get them into this training program very I'm effective compassion training that. <laughs> yeah yeah I think so um I mean I've had people tell me that that like in their own reflections of the practice that they've noticed benefits for themselves, but also like they've noticed benefits in other ways with their, with their relationships or with their friends or roommates or, or however it may be, um, that there's some, something is happening. There's a shift for them. Um, and you know, that being said, it's a process and like going back to one of your questions earlier, like as we're training, you know, we might sh see the practice showing up in various parts of our lives, but then we might still have other difficulties. And that in itself can be a kind of teaching that occurs where, oh, like, oh, I'm having this difficulty, this pattern of emotion is still arising for me. Like, I'm still getting angry, even though I've been doing all these practices on love and compassion. And it's like, that's actually kind of a gift. Like, we can notice that difficulty that's occurring and, and then work with it. Like, that's, pointing us out a direction for practice that I'm still getting angry in this situation. We can be curious about that and, and engage with that in practice. It doesn't have to be perceived as some kind of problem or, or difficulty. It's just, that's the very direction. 
Yeah, it's worth saying, you know, practice, not just compassion training, but all trainings, they happen in the context of our lives. Mm -hmm. And quite often, I think, I mean, I sat with Mac, with Mark for a number of years at Edinburgh. And there was a feeling, as we did the sessions, Mark, on a Friday night, of everyone would come with their week. You know, and you would sort of leave it at the door, but of course you're bringing it with you. And then the discussion topic of the night would quite often, the context of conversation would be, yeah, right, because this week, blah, blah, blah. And um, it's kind of intuitive when you put it in those terms that life throwing you stuff is actually just more information for the practice. Mm -hmm. I can, I can. Yeah, sometimes I, sometimes I tell my students in the classroom that, uh, you know, when I get upset or pissed off, it's actually kind of a fun thing because it's like, okay, there's some, there's something I need to practice with right there's there. I need some cleaning up, growing up, yeah. waking up. Yeah. Um, Paul, awesome. And I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to touch on one thing before we left. Mm -hmm. There's these three types of compassion training. And I was just interested in whether there was an order that people should be developing them in or any instruction kind of on, with a practical edge. So those three modes of receiving, deepening and inclusive. Yeah, great question, Jamie. Um, so, yeah, it may be that different people kind of connect with different modes or different ways of engaging the practice at first. So for some people, it may be that that, that relational starting point idea of receiving care is a little bit challenging. And so entering into the practice by doing the, the inclusive mode first or the deepening mode first can be a way of, of engaging or, or just settling into meditation to begin and then come back to the uh, relational receiving mode. So in that way, it's not, it's not a linear sequence of like you have to do step one and step two and step three, step four, even though like often we teach it that way, like in a retreat or in the classroom, like a kind of progression of a curriculum. But then people will, they've been exposed to the pattern and then people will find, okay, there's a particular practice that is most inspiring for them or is working really well for them in the moment. So do that practice for a few weeks or a few months and see where it goes and then come back and, and then explore the others. So yeah, it's kind of, um, it's not linear and each person will uh, take it up in the way that works best for them. Paul, where can everybody find you online? Yeah, so we have a website. Uh, John and I have a website called sustainablecompassion.org. And we have a list of events and um, also audio teachings and readings where people can learn more about this and find access to uh, meditation events and teachings. I also have a website, uh, paulcondon.org, that also has um, all of my academic writings and work, so uh, people can find more there as well. Paul, thanks so much for coming on. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, that has been the Contemplative Science Podcast. Thanks for joining us wherever you are in the world. And as always, we'll be back next week. <laughs>